Hi everybody, Scott here. This is the fifth detail drawing video and in this video we're going to show you how to convert a fit into a set of tolerances that you can then apply in your detail drawings. So this is a table that we have in our engineering drawing handbook. It's a lot to take in but we'll use it quite a bit so we should become very familiar with it. We should note that this is table A2 and it's selected fits for general use on a whole basis. There's also a table on a shaft basis, but typically we use the whole basis uh, one which I'm showing here. And on the top of this, the whole basis means that the smallest hole as we discussed, um, that is given the nominal dimension. So if we have something that's a 20 millimeter um, fit or a hole on a shaft, then the whole basis is the zero point or is the, the 20 millimeters in this case. And then we have on the top side here, in these cases, we have the variations on the holes that are allowed for each of these different tolerances. You'll see that the H11 is quite big, H9 is a bit smaller, quite a bit smaller, and then that's the same between these two because it's the same H9. We have a H8, a H7 that's used all the way through here, and we typically don't go finer for most applications than a H7 on the holes. On the underside, we have the shaft deviations. So here the C11, again, quite big and quite a bit smaller than the nominal dimension here. So we have a big gap there. We have a D10, which is getting a little bit uh, smaller in deviation and closer to the nominal size. The E9, the F7, the G6, and the H6. And then beyond this point, we get into what we call transition fits. So this is where the shaft and the hole are nearly the same size. And even the shaft can be larger than the hole which will generate um, what we call an interference fit in some of these cases, depending on which side of this tolerance our parts end up on. And then further along, getting into the P6s and the S6s, combined with the H7s, we get the true interference fits. So in these fits, the shaft is always uh, equal to or bigger than uh, the hole. So there's always gonna be an interference and it's always gonna be hard to get them together. Let's now locate the fits that we've specified for uh, the bolt and the bolt holes. So that was the H11, C11. And we can also locate the H7, K6 fit, which we specified for the shafts going into our coupling. As a designer, sometimes you'll be told what fits to make your parts to get the uh, correct clearance between them. And in other cases, you'll have to figure out what the best uh, fit is through trial and error or simply through a bit of research. So we've shown an example here of a piston and conrod assembly. Some of you may be familiar with this if you know about engines. Some of you uh, won't be very familiar with this, but basically this is the piston that goes up and down inside uh, your car engine typically and it's connected via this gudgeon pin here, also called a wrist pin, to the conrod. And this is the conrod here, and this gudgeon pin sits inside this bushing. This bushing is pressed into the connecting rod, and the connecting rod is made in two pieces, which clamps together over another bearing here, which goes onto your crankshaft typically, and it's got bolts here to bolt it all together. So this is what you get typically inside of a, of a car engine, and let's have a look at the different fits that might be used in different instances on this assembly. So we've already uh, looked at an example of a, of a typical bolt clearance fit so that it's uh, easy to assemble and that would be down here in the coarse clearance fit end of our table. If we look at an example here of the fit between this gudgeon pin and the bushing, we want this to be able to rotate freely and it's also oiled as well. So we're going for uh, a tighter clearance fit here so that the, that rotation can happen quite easily. So we'd use something in this sort of range here. In terms of this gudgeon pin fitting inside this piston, we want to be able to push this gudgeon pin in and have it stay there and not rotate around. If it rotates around inside the piston here, it's going to wear out and we'll have to replace the piston. We would prefer it to rotate on the bushing here so that if the bushing wears out, we can disassemble this, quickly replace the bushing and put everything back together and that's the cheapest option. So in this case, we want this to be in the transition fit region, which means it might be a little bit hard to put inside the piston. We may have to heat the piston up and put the gudgeon pin in the freezer in for a while so it can go in and even then we might have to apply a bit of pressure to get it to seat home properly. 
another example here is the fit for our bushing with our connecting rod. And so the bushings are typically typically made from soft, um, low friction, good wearing materials. And when we press that into our connecting rod, we want that to not um, spin around. If it spins around, the end is going to stop working very quickly. So this has quite a heavy interference fit, partially due to the nature of the material used in the bushing. It's not very stiff. So we would use that so that it is well located in there and it doesn't spin about. All of the rotation is taken between the bushing and the gudgeon pin. So now if we take our example of the H11C11 fit that we've seen for a few of these bolts that we've been looking at, we'll show you now how to look up on the table what the actual tolerances are that we need to place on the dimensions of the bolt, in this case the shaft, and also the hole that the bolt is going through. So we found the correct column and we read down and we remember that the holes are the H and these other letters here are the shafts. So if you're unsure, just check the H11, H11 and this is the hole and then the C11, C11 and this is the shaft. And then we read down our table and find the diameter of our bolt. Be aware that this um, column here is above this dimension and this dimension here is up to and including. So if we had something that was 10, we would read uh, this row here, which is up to and including 10. We wouldn't read this one over here, which is anything above 10. So just be aware of that. So we're focusing on this little box here and let's blow that up so that we can see it a little bit more clearly. So again, we're in this box here and we're after the H11C11, and we've got two numbers for our shaft and our hole. So that's what we're going to read off, and what these actually are, if you look back over to the table, it tells us that these units are in microns, micrometers. So this basically means for our hole, the H11, we have our nominal size, which uh, from memory in this case was 8, so the smallest hole size in this case will be 8, and the largest hole size will be 8 plus 90 microns. So we have to be careful of our units here, a thousandth of a millimetre. In terms of the shaft, we've got a C11 over here. So the biggest shaft size that we're allowed is 8 millimetres minus, and it's a minus because we see this minus sign in the top of our column, so it's 8 minus 80 microns, and the smallest shaft size is 8 minus 170 microns. Let's have a look at that um, in a bit bigger scale, and we can put the numbers in into our uh, drawing that we have here, showing the deviations of the hole and the deviations of the shaft. So if we transfer those numbers down, it looks something like this. So again, this is our basic size, or our basis size of 8 millimetres. So it can be exactly on 8 millimetres for the hole, or it can be slightly bigger by 90 microns for the shaft. It, for this fit, it actually needs to be uh, a bit under 8 millimetres at its biggest. So 8 millimetres minus 80 microns, and it can be smaller down to 8 millimetres minus 170 microns. So let's come back to the actual dimensions. We recall that this is 8 millimetres here on this shaft, or this bolt. So now we transfer these tolerances onto our hole dimensions, which would give us a diameter of 8 plus 0 0.09, so that's 90 microns minus nothing. And we're lucky because this is already in the MMC condition, in that we have the maximum material part specified with the zero, which is the smallest hole, and then if we have a bigger hole, we've got the least material condition up here, so that's the way we want to represent it. Unfortunately for our shaft, it's not complete yet. We've got a diameter of 8, but we've got minus 0 0.08 millimetres and minus 0.17 millimetres, so they're the conversions again from microns into millimetres. This is not quite ready yet to put on our engineering drawing. We need to put this into the maximum material uh, condition and the way of stating that dimension. So the way we would do that is as follows. If we look at this diagram again, we realise that our maximum material condition is our biggest shaft. And the biggest shaft in this case is 8 minus 0 0.08 of a millimetre. So this is it here. And if we actually do the maths on that, we realise that that is actually 7.92. So this is the number that we want to state on our drawing. So we put that one there, and then we get a zero on the plus side. 
and then we look at the difference between these two here. So if we go 17 minus 8, we get left with 9. So we can go from this minus another 0 0.09 millimetres, and that will give us uh, this minimum material condition down here. So this is the way that we want to write it on our drawing. One of the reasons for this is that if you have a shaft and you're turning it down progressively, you want to know at what size, when I hit this size, will it be allowable? You don't want the person machining it to have to do these calculations on paper or with a calculator. You just want to tell them, once you get to 7.92 millimetres, we're going to be happy with that. But if you go a little further, you're allowed to go an additional negative 0.09 millimetres under this.